Thank you for joining us today. My name is Brad Miller, and this is the Chronically Human podcast, where we have discussions aimed at creating a better world with more individual freedom and less unnecessary suffering. Today, I'm joined by Dave Herman. He is the chairman of the American Kratom Association, and they are on the front lines pushing back against attempts to ban Kratom on the local, state, and federal level. Dave fills us in on what AKA is currently doing to keep Kratom legal. He also dispels the FDA's attacks against the plant, and he discusses what science is currently saying about Kratom. I think this is an important conversation for anyone, whether you use Kratom every day like I do, or if you've never heard of the plant, because we get to the heart of the matter, and that is, should individuals be free to choose for themselves what they do for their health and well-being, or should it be dictated by government? So I hope that you'll check out the conversation and let us know what you think about the state of health and freedom in America, and specifically what you think about keeping Kratom legal. Thank you. Thanks, Dave, for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome, Brad. Excellent, man. I just want to say personally, I take Kratom myself, and I'm a huge fan of what you guys are doing at the American Kratom Association. And uh, how did you get involved? Most people don't even know what Kratom is, let alone are actively pushing to keep it legal. Well, I have a, a relative that's had two fusions, three fusions now, um, several surgeries. And the, the net result is what a lot of people get, which is chronic pain. And through that, I was searching other methodologies. Uh, luckily, we haven't had an addiction issue from opioids, but it's certainly possible. And I came across Kratom and I came across an old friend of mine simultaneously. So I have a background, uh, first private sector, but then public uh, nonprofits. And he asked me if I would sit on the board of the American Kratom Association. And I said, sure, bigger learning curve. And within two weeks of getting on the board, I was chairman. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And so that was pushing two years ago. And we've been off to the races ever since. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's actually um, an awesome deal that you guys are doing. Now, I did notice on your website that you have the Good Manufacturing Practices Initiative. Um, how did that get started? And I see there's, there's quite a few people involved. And why, why did you guys start that? Well, to begin with, we're a consumer organization, and that's our, our, our reason for being. Mm -hmm. But what we found was between the disinformation coming from the FDA and the inability for anyone else to corral those cats that are called vendors, and herding cats is tough, uh, we felt like we had no choice. And what we want to do is show that there is a regulatory purpose that this is a maturing industry and that a lot of the concerns that are voiced are voiced incorrectly. Uh, to do that, manufacturers owe the consumer a safe and, and measurable product. And so we said, well, if no one else is doing it, then we're going to do it. And we came up with recommendations that would fit very well into FDA's reg regulations on supplements. Um, we think that a regulated product from the Kratom industry, willingly done, will show Congress will show the government agencies and will show the consumer there really is a mature, safe product out there. So th that's the reason for it. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I I looked into Kratom a few years ago, um, and there was a lot of stuff going on out there. It seemed like that, uh, that you weren't sure who to use and what to use. And then I found um, this company, uh, Natural Organics. That's who I, that's who I use. Um, and I saw they're part of your, your good manufacturing product practices. So I, I thought that was a good thing. Definitely. Now on your website, you have a clock that's counting down or counting up. I should say it's been 174 mm -hmm. days since the FDA has ignored your uh, request for a meeting. What are you guys hoping to talk to them about it specifically with Scott Gottlieb? Is that who you're trying to get a hold of? Well, we'd love to do that. The, we don't think he's willing to do that, obviously. Uh, <laughs> what we're trying to say is there are valid scientists and a large number of them who've researched the issue of Kratom and Kratom safety and addiction. And we want to get into a room with those scientists and FDA and present the scientific case for the safety profile of Kratom. Um, that seems to be something they would rather not do. Uh, in fact, it sounds like they'd rather bob for piranha. 
So <laughs> he said, let's put up a clock and show how long it's been since we have asked for that meeting. And we'll do it anytime, anywhere. Uh, I certainly don't need to be involved. I'm not a scientist. But there's some very reputable people at some very reputable institutions that would love to have that conversation. And we don't understand why FDA won't have it. That is an interesting take. Is uh, I know for me, I'm a conspiracy guy. I do believe in conspiracies, and uh, personally, and you know, I think that they're trying to protect. You know, they're not. They're trying to protect the pharmaceutical industry because they actually get. I think it's like forty to fifty percent of their budget directly from the pharmaceutical industry now. And I know that's probably not something you guys get into into the weeds on, but uh, I think that's a factor. Actually, we do look into that, and and I, I don't think personally, that it is a pharmaceutical company conspiracy. Okay. I think it goes back to the Deshea Act of 90, 1994, mm. where Congress stepped in and told the uh, FDA that they were not going to take control of the supplements industry as they do so many others. Um, that was the dividing line. They didn't take it well and, and uh, did everything they could to, to take it over. The net effect is they still want to regulate everything that's out there, and we don't think they're competent or capable or need to do any of that. They're infringing on basic freedoms. Yes. As far as their budget coming from pharmaceutical firms, figures don't lie, but liars figure. It's just one of those things. Um, right. If you look at the FDA's own website, you'll find something called FDA user fees. And if you research that further, you'll see that if someone files a new drug application, an NDA, mm -hmm. and it requires clinical trial, the down payment is over two and a half million dollars. And that the ongoing annual expense is over three hundred thousand dollars. So every time they can take, uh, say, a supplement and declare it a drug and have them go through that process, they're cranking up mm, four million dollars overall. Wow. $5 million overall. And so now we'll come back to what you just said, which is a large portion of their budget comes from the pharmaceutical industry. Well, it does. But this is how the bulk of it comes in. It's through FDA user fees. And so if there's a conspiracy, it's a conspiracy for control. I don't think it's this dark room filled with star chambers and a bunch of guys plotting. I got you. I'm a big fan of X-Files. So, I, I mean, I, I do I do dig into that, you know. And uh, I don't I don't put anything past anybody when uh, when you get people around like trillions of dollars of money. But I, well, I, I haven't found Fox Mulder in our group yet, so I'll let you know. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, I, I respect that. And you're right about the, the breaking down the facts with the, the user fees and how that actually works. So that, I, I really appreciate that information. Now, you talked about the science with and I think that's something that you guys have done exceptionally well. I think that um, if if you guys were around for the cannabis industry, 80 years ago, I don't think cannabis would have ever been made illegal. Uh, but you guys or are actually, marijuana. go ahead. Or called marijuana. Or see, that's exactly right. People don't understand uh, about prohibition and how it actually started. And that if, if we just kept, kept the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act, you know, people wouldn't be dying of overdoses. People would know what they're gonna get. You know, they could, you could actually buy heroin back then over the counter. Um, I don't know if we're going to get to that or not um, in this in my lifetime, but it's important to realize that it, I think that there is, uh, you know, a place for. I'm not a big fan of regulation at all, but there's a place, I guess, for most people when they when they think of regulation. I think the supplement industry is the way to go forward, and that's your model. Is that correct with the American Kratom Association? Yes, we think kratom is is both a supplement and a food. Uh, or more accurately, a dietary ingredient. Excuse me, I'll get rid of that. No, you don't. A dietary ingredient in a food. Okay. Um, what we cannot really understand is, given the safety profile and given the information that's out there proving the safety profile, why on God's earth would the FDA be this vested in bothering a plant that you can pick off a tree that resembles the coffee family. Uh, I've used the analogy, it's like using a cannon to shoot a fly. What's the purpose? And, and I, we don't understand it to this day, but every time we think that, the, that common sense will rear its ugly head, and I notice your T-shirt, I'll give you one you should be wearing. Okay. Common sense is so rare, we should call it a superpower. That, that's true, yeah, definitely. So we, we, we have a problem there. 
Um, we want to work with them, not against them. Uh, okay. That makes us a little different than a lot of the other groups. I don't believe that that there's intent of evil. I believe there's a tent of incompetence. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't believe they understand what they're saying. And when we have uh, Gottlieb getting out in front and making statements about Kratom that are blatantly untrue, we're crossing a line between incompetence and evil. I'm not quite sure where it all lands, but it, it bothers us. We challenge it regularly. And the latest challenge was a letter, a 33 page letter debunking their eight factor analysis um, from October of 17. Eight factor analysis is a statutory requirement that FDA didn't do the first go around when they tried to schedule Kratom. And we did. We had it done. And it's just what it sounds like. There's eight factors that determine uh, whether to move forward or not. The three primary that we look at, and there is something called a three-factor analysis during an emergency scheduling. But we look at potential for, for abuse, potential for addiction, and, and uh, danger to the public health. Okay. Through the science, what we found is there's a low potential for addiction. You can become addicted to anything, water. But there's a low potential for addiction. There's a low potential for abuse. Um, and if you look at animal studies, you can't find enough volume of kratom to kill them other than maybe suffocate them. The kratom won't do it. And we find no, no potential uh, danger to the public health and well-being. If that's the case, then Americans should be allowed to ingest anything they want as long as it doesn't harm them. And that's where we see this falling. We're not making any medical claims. We certainly see the studies that are ongoing and we hear testimony. And Brad, I know that you have ulcerative colitis. Right. Uh, that's mm -hmm. I'm extremely familiar with through a couple of friends of mine. Uh, and if that helps you, why should you not be allowed to take it? Because you're not going to get high. There is no psychotropic effect from Kratom, regardless of what anyone says. And part of our, our GMP standards is to be sure that we don't manipulate or adulterate. Okay. And the two primary alkaloids, and there's over 20 alkaloids, but the two primary alkaloids in Kratom are metragynine and 7-OH, hydroxymetragynine. The 7-OH, according to the uh, recent study by Hemby et al., which is Hemby, uh, McCurdy, Averett, and Cutler, um, shows that metragynine is not an abusive, dangerous, addictive product. And when they do talk about the 7-OH, in its natural proportions inside the plant, it is so small that it's a trace element and it really isn't dangerous. Oh, wow. So for us, it became logical to say, well, if that is the element that is dangerous and it is so small in the plant that it is not a danger, let's have a restriction that you're not allowed to artificially increase it beyond the natural levels in the plant. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And we have legislation going on in four states or five states or six states. Three have filed. Michigan, uh, Utah just came out of committee. Mm -hmm. uh, Georgia is just finishing committee where we want the states to ban sales under 18 because, frankly, a child should make decisions with their parents. Yes, I totally agree with that. We want to warn uh, against the use by pregnant women, not because we found a danger, but because it's never been tested for that. Right. Um, and we want proper labeling. We want you to understand that when you pick up a bag of Kratom, that's what you're receiving, that the proportions are according to what's in the natural plant itself, non-juice, non-adulterated, mm -hmm. uh, because the deaths that we find, every one of them is polydrug or adulteration. We have found no death, regardless of what anyone else says. Uh, that's related to Kratom, right. specifically, causation. But we have found uh, there were some cases in Sweden that are the primary catalyst for FDA's movement, frankly. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, in 2009, uh, there were nine deaths in Sweden from a street drug called Krypton. Interesting name, planet Krypton, I guess. Okay. But Krypton was comprised of Kratom powder, and nine people died. And you'd think, well, if it killed nine people, we darn sure ought to get on this. Within two years of those deaths, a Swedish scientific group, Kronstrand et al., and it's available in the literature, found that what killed the nine people wasn't the kratom, but it was kratom mixed with a product called odesmethyltramadol, mm -hmm. which is a metabolite of tramadol. 
And so that debunked completely that entire theory. But to this day, they list the Krypton deaths as causation by Kratom, and they know it's not true. Um, so you asked earlier about the scientists. Well, we'd love to get in a room with all these folks and, and discuss these things in great depth because the depth is there. And we have spent the last two years uh, not getting involved in the silly gossip, right. but moving into what is true, what is provable, what is scientific, and how does it impact our consumer? Well, that's, and that's what we're I'm glad you guys are there because – I, I, I didn't feel comfortable really taking it until um, until Chris Bell was on the Joe Rogan podcast and he talked mm -hmm. about it. And from there, I did my research and found you guys and then found Natural Organics. And so I think there's a way to do – I think what you guys are doing is a, a model for, for almost a self-regulatory -regula process where you have people within the industry that are making sure the standards are being kept. Well, I think you will be the self-regulator. Uh, the consumer. Yeah. Because what we're trying to do is identify those people that are willing to adhere to a standard of behavior that is appropriate and safe. Mm -hmm. And by publishing the people who willingly step forward, and this is a, a, a willing collaboration, this isn't us dictating anything. All voluntary. They willingly step forward and say, I will do these things, and then it, submit themselves to third party audit to prove they're doing it. That makes you as a consumer safer. Right. Well, now we've got you regulating the people that sell the product because I cannot imagine why you would buy from someone who isn't doing that. And, and that's our hope. Um, there's always going to be somebody that says I can get it for $10 less. But that's where the danger crops up. You know, we have seen counterfeit Kratom. We have seen, I think it was in Texas a couple of years ago. I don't know exactly. Uh, we saw Kratom powder mixed with hydrocodone. Um, adulterated product. And we think the actual bad actor in the Kratom world is those who would adulterate. Right. And we want that outlawed. That's part of these bills. Mm -hmm. and, and quite frankly, if you do that, you ought to go to jail. I agree. We'd be the first ones to turn you in. That's a form of fraud. You know, so I, we, I think that, yeah, that the government should step in with force or fraud when people are committing that against each other. I like the idea of self-regulating that people can find out for themselves who are voluntarily taking the steps to get a good product out to you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What, what do you guys think about, um, you, we talked briefly about deaths associated or the, what the FDA claims are deaths associated with Kratom. It seems like those numbers, uh, they jump around a lot. Sometimes it's 34, sometimes it's 44. Uh, but if, if you dig into them, it looks like, like you talked about polypharmacy, and actually there's some other deaths that have nothing to do with Kratom at all. Well, not according to the FDA. Right. Uh, what, you, what you're describing is something called the FDA Adverse Events Reporting System, which is called FAIRS. In the FAIRS system, they listed last time I looked, and could be 100 by who knows. But for time immemorial, they show 44 deaths from Kratom. Not for this year, forever. By the way, as a sidebar, uh, the medically assisted treatment uh, industry pushes methadone pretty hard. And according to CDC, uh, there are 5,400 methadone overdoses per year. Wow. So let's bring that back down to the 44 we're discussing. In the 44 are the nine Krypton deaths that I told you about. Okay. There's another one where a guy in Germany fell out of a window, did grievous bodily harm to himself and refused medical care, and he died. That was a Kratom death. Um, we had a gunshot wound to the chest, and the man died, but he had Kratom in his system. That's listed there. And my comment on that one was I think we should ban all bullets that have been rubbed with Kratom. <laughs> That that would do it. That would do we it. Have, sadly, a lot of these are very sad. It is I, terrible. I'm in light of them because of the FDA, not because of what happened to these people. Right. But uh, uh, we had one where there was a suicide in the history of, of bipolar, long, long history of bipolar, mm -hmm. cradle death. Um, we have two guys that went out partying and party hardy. I mean, they did drugs, they did alcohol, there was heroin in their system, and they died in a cradle. The most telling in all of this is that when you get to the, the uh, um, I forgot the database, but it has to do with, with uh, uh, poison control centers. Right. There's a reported death of a young man in Michigan 
the same death, the same date of death, the same date of birth are also in the FAERS database. So we link those two together, we being Dr. Jane Babin. And what we found was that in the, in the, in the uh, poison control report, they listed the six things, I think there were six, uh, in that boy's system. And they listed them from most dangerous to least dangerous. The most dangerous was pink, which is a street drug that's outlawed, uh, opioid. Okay. And the least dangerous was kratom. Now that's in the, in the poison control report, but when you get to the FAIRS report, pink has been eliminated. It's not shown at all. Wow. Somebody manipulated the data. There's your conspiracy. <laughs> that's a conspiracy. That's right. Yeah, there's proof right there. <laughs> um, so you have the same death reported in two systems, but in one system, it's shown as a kratom-related death, and in the other system, it's shown a number of items in the tox report that are much more deadly than kratom. Yep. It's amazing uh, that, that they're still... Um, and those deaths that they claim are over like a 20 year period, aren't they? Don't they look at a long well, time? Like 11 years or 10 years 10 or seven years. years. But, it, you know, it's really all they have forever. And that's across the forever. world. Yeah. And that's across the world because the, the guy in the window in Germany, the nine deaths in Sweden, um, uh, half of the deaths, I think, were out of the country. Okay. So now we come to the argument that arises all the time about whether Kratom has grass standard. Grass is generally regarded as safe right. under the Deshaies Act, mm -hmm. uh, which exempts it from a lot of issues from, from regulatory constraints. And for the grass standard, uh, or for, for the Deshaies Act, uh, you have to have been in commerce prior to October 15, 1994, and you have to prove that. The problem is when you go back that far, that wasn't the world of computers. Right. In fact, I, I'm not sure I had a bag phone in 1994. Pretty sure I didn't. I think that came later. Um, so we're looking for proof, and FDA has defined that proof of commerce has to be in the United States, and we don't understand that. We can prove worldwide use of Kratom going back hundreds of years. Uh, Kratom really came to the U.S. after the Vietnam War with veterans and South Vietnamese that were escaping, and it was used in their culture over there. And that was, uh, they think, the major origin, and it's grown decade by decade. So if you can tell me that a guy falling out of a window in Germany and nine people dying in Sweden is relevant, how can you tell me that Kratom has to be in commerce only in the U.S. during that same time frame? We have a hard time with that. That is insane. There's no logic here. <laughs> you know, when it comes to government regulations, it seems like, that. yeah, I agree. There's no logic or common sense from our point of view, but from the point of view of, of the bureaucracy and the regulatory machine, they're always trying to grow, it seems like. It's like a, an organism, and they're just trying to keep expanding, and I think um, they're, they're trying to take us over. That's my take, anyway. <laughs> But, uh, I don't disagree with you. You know, laughingly, and I was in the private sector for many years before I got in the nonprofit world, and folks that worked for me, I'd say, I know what your job really is, because everybody had all these tall tales they were telling me. And they said, what's that? I said, your job is to get an assistant. <laughs> that is perfect. I have to use that. That's a good one. And so that's what people spend their time trying to do. Well, I think from a regulatory agency, um, FDA's job is to control everything they can possibly control. Mm -hmm. We would like to work with them, not against them. We're being forced into this position. Um, and, and you go back to the CGMP standards that we're advocating. You go back to the regulatory constraints we think are necessary for the protection of the consumer. That's the same thing FDA is supposed to be doing. <laughs> Right. We work with them on this. We, we open our hands to them. And it's very frustrating that we're spending blood and treasure to stop them from banning a product that shouldn't be banned. And we're help, willing to help regulate it. So it, it's confusing at times, to say the least. Definitely is. I, I totally agree. Here at Chronically Human, we're, we're a libertarian that uh, trends into radical individualism. So the less, the less regulation we believe the better are self-regulation. Like we want the consumer to regulate industries. And I think that's a, a perfect way that you put that. Well, I'm mu much uh, in tune with the, the 10th Amendment. And I think anything not specifically given to the federal government, the Constitution belongs to the states. 
and let the states regulate. And the beauty of that, not available to everyone, but available to a lot of people, is if you have a state that does things you don't like, you can move to another state. Right. It's that simple. That is true. And so you go to a state that will do what you like. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that Utah, which is a very conservative area of the country, has just come out in favor of the Creative Consumer Protection Bill. It came out of committee with a five to one vote. And the one vote against wasn't against this. It was against any kind of control. Um, that's a stepping stone in the right direction. So you're a libertarian. I'm 10th Amendment. But the bottom line is the local community, I think, will always do a better job. And as this thing has evolved, the FDA has asked DEA to ban or schedule one Kratom. Mm -hmm. People talk about the different schedules. There's only one for Kratom. And the reason for that is, according to the scheduling of the Controlled Substances Act, uh, Schedule One has no approved medical use, operative word there, approved. So if there's no FDA-approved medical use, then you're only eligible for Schedule One, and that's, that's a total ban. Uh, that total ban would make getting a Schedule One research license extremely difficult and expensive. Uh, it would mean that the researchers would not have the ability to handily get consistent product for testing. It would be really a bad problem. And the best example, and you brought it up a little bit earlier, if you look at medical marijuana, over the last decade, there have been a lot of discoveries that help people. That's the reason that on the medical side of it, um, it, it's become very popular. Right. But we lost a tremendous amount of time and money because of Schedule One and the, and the Controlled Substances Act. Now we're looking at Kratom. I can tell you that research is ongoing for high blood pressure, um, for cardia, cardiac or cardio. Um, it's going on with opioid addiction potential, withdrawal help. Um, it's going on for heavy pain use. Um, th there's a lot of things that are being researched and they need to be researched. And if you never once take Kratom for any other reason than it's your own well-being, you should be allowed to do that. But if you hamper the research, what are we going to lose? Because we lost a lot the last go round. We did. Yeah. yeah so, it's, it's a tragedy really with, with prohibition. I wanted to bring that up. I'm glad you brought that up that the NIH now is uh, giving three and a half million dollars, I believe it's to the University of Florida, the College of Pharmacology. Um, yeah, to Dr. Do, do, I'm sorry? Dr. Christopher McCurdy. McCurdy, gotcha. And he's they're looking to do um, uh, human trials in about in five years. I thought that was amazing. It is, and, and they're on a path that, that uh, we've discussed. Uh, I think the world of Dr. McCurdy uh, have spent time with him. Um, this shows that NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, mm -hmm. is interested in seeing what can come out of this. They're also uh, a group that initially put out information on their website talking about the safety of metragynine, the key component in Kratom. And then they stepped away from that and removed it. And now they've acknowledged it again. And the most important part of their acknowledgement is that they acknowledge the deaths that are cited uh, could be cited more for adulterated kratom than for kratom. The bad actor is adulteration, not the core, core leaf. Um, so having NIDA take that position is extremely helpful to us. And, and going back, the first time FDA did this was August of 2016. They asked DEA to step out. That's when DEA stepped out. Mm -hmm. Over 140,000 emails came in. Um, 23,000 comments, um, over 60 members of Congress objected, over 1,200 doctors. Um, there was a hue and cry from the land that said this isn't necessary. And emergency scheduling means that you think there's an imminent threat to the public health. Well, time has proved that's just not true. So they rescinded that in October of 2016, at which point DEA asked FDA to do a, a expedited uh, eight-factor analysis to prove the case. And the definition of expedited, it took from October of 2016 to October of 2017 to expedite. We got it done in a month or two. And, that's, and that document has now been peer-reviewed. 
uh, and it's around the world. And so now we come up to October and, and 2017 with this FDA eight factor analysis that interestingly enough, FDA, uh, DEA released accidentally, they claim, but they released it. And once they released it, they couldn't unrelease it. Right. Prior to that, they could claim we took it illegally, but they can't now. And so we turned that over to our scientists and the 33 page letter debunking it uh, is interesting because when they released it, it's a two sided document. So we got every other page. I've noticed that with with yeah with government documents because I think it was Obama he passed a law where he had to use both sides of the paper, and but when they, they scan it now that you're only getting half half the document. So even with half, the the one of the scientists I'll not name him specifically in this one, but this is one of the twelve said if I had done this level of work when I was at the government they would have fired me. Wow, it was that bad. And so the net result is a 33-page footnoted letter uh, that went to the leaders of the House and the Senate, um, DEA, FDA, and every man known to earth. We sent it to 7,500 members of the National uh, uh, Coalition of State Legislatures. Um, it's out there. And again, we welcomed the conversation and the meeting to discuss these things. But it took them that long to put out a piece of crap work. That's what it is. It's crap work. Uh, and so we're, again, stunned that they won't step forward and give a proper hearing to something that's worthwhile. Right. You know, it, it, and as far as the pharmaceutical firms in general, yeah, I guess if somebody could get it banned and then take 10 years and develop a product and then sell it, they could make some money. But the their competition is a guy in a boat going down the river and picking it off a tree. Right. It's hard to compete with that. Definitely. It's hard to be. Yeah, definitely. That's yeah. a great point about um, it, it's um, indigenous use over in Southeast Asia. Th these trees grow naturally in the jungle and then they have small plantations and some people actually have them right outside their house. Right. That They just go and pick them and, and they chew them. Uh, I think I read that over a million people in Thailand are regular users. Of it's a big number and they've never had a recorded death. And, and of course, it's Thai, Indonesia and Malaysia mostly where this comes from, some Vietnam. Um, and we're looking for microclimates, we being the industry, not Dave, uh, in the U.S. that will support uh, the growth of Kratom as, an, as a cash crop here in America. Uh, we think the product is safe. We think it's tested. Um, anyone bringing in something that's bad or has salmonella or heavy metals or any of this other stuff, you know, you can get rid of that stuff. You can sterilize, you can make clean. And so we see vendors that are doing exactly that. We see other vendors that reject any product that through testing uh, is shown to have the bad components. So is it possible? I don't think you can bring in anything from any country anywhere to the US that isn't contaminated. Right. The job is to make it clean. <laughs> right. And we can do that. You know, you can argue about how, is it radiation, is it sterilization, is it steam, but you can do that. So that is a straw man argument that has no basis in anything. The argument is a simple one. Is this a product that is addictive, abusive, and harmful to the public health? And our answer to all three of those is no. No. Right. Yeah, those are, that's what boils down to. Now, what are you seeing yeah. with, with the FDA and at Customs? Because I think a lot of vendors are having some issues um, getting product through Customs. Are, are they cracking down on that more? Or Absolutely. They have tripled the number of agents that are being used uh, to interdict Kratom as it comes in. The In 2012, there was an import alert mm -hmm. from FDA. The import alert was based on the Krypton deaths, the nine that I mentioned to you, right. which happened in 2009 and were debunked in 2011. But in 2012, we now have an import alert, which was renewed in 2014 and 2016. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, the courts give FDA the benefit of the doubt on science. When they make that uh, something that they're trying to interdict and it's a manpower issue. If they could interdict everything, they would, and there's multiple ways of people bringing it in. But the import alert is there, and it's harming people. Mm -hmm. It's harming vendors. Um, when that happens, the import alert becomes 
reputational risk for banks. So let's say we have a bank that doesn't want to give you credit card processing because that's the other part of that. The excuse is that uh, different wording in different agencies, but if you looked at DEA, it's drugs and chemicals of concern. Mm -hmm. Kratom is listed as a drug and chemical of concern, which raises uh, reputational risk for anyone doing business with Kratom vendors. And the origin for that is the import alerts. Okay. So if you can get rid of the import alert, you've removed the listing probably of drugs and chemicals of concern, at which point you now are able to say the reputational risk has been removed and therefore credit card processing becomes the norm. Um, you know the problems that exist in the marijuana industry, but they're schedule one, we're not. Right. And so as a schedule one drug, they have a hard time getting a checking account. There's a lot of issues there that are financial in nature. We shouldn't be subject to any of those. We are not a scheduled uh, item. It's like uh, it's almost like shadow prohibition to a certain degree that they're trying. It's to a shadow, a shadow ban. Yeah, I used to be in banking, and I know banks hate risk. That's the that's the you know they they really they run from it, and there's a lot of, of vagueness and gray areas when it comes to banks getting audited uh, by the FDIC and the different um, the people who regulate it. And so if they see anything that might be a red flag, they just run. And I think that's I think that's personally criminal. If it's a legal product, you know, you shouldn't be able to. I know there's supposed to be a private industry or a private company and say I, I won't do business with X, Y, and Z. But if you're basing it on, you know, bad science that the government is giving out, and you're you're part of a regulated industry that has basically a monopoly on um, on banking, then I think there's a real issue with that. Well, okay, so even further. If you look at the credit card processing industry, in theory, the banks and the credit card processors can determine who they do business with to some extent. Mm -hmm. But in fact, over 80% of the credit card business done in the United States comes from Visa and MasterCard. Wow. If you look at the core manual for Visa, they have a very clear prohibition on selling Kratom. Mm -hmm. It's in writing. Okay. There's less than clear prohibition from MasterCard, but it's there as well. So now you're looking at the credit card processor being leveraged in a different way. But all of it comes back to reputational risk. Um, there have been, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 lawsuits against Visa and MasterCard for different areas, not exactly this area. Mm -hmm. But they are a quasi-monopoly. Right. And even though they're publicly owned stock traded companies, uh, they are a quasi-monopoly, 80% market share plus. Right. Then you take that out a little bit further and you look at their top six institutional shareholders. Um, they're the same six for both. Not the same order, but they're the same six. Right. You want to see Garden, BlackRock, and you know the, the State Street, the same six. So we think that a lot of this can be cured. We believe the key is getting rid of the import alert. But what we really have to show is a mature regulated industry that is taking care of the consumer and that as a result of that, a ban is not warranted. That's, so that's now we come full circle again. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to work with these folks. We want to be on the same team. Come on and join us. We're here. We're willing. Well, I think that's what well, you talked about, the Tenth Amendment and how important that is. Because I did, uh, I, I met you down at the, uh, the state capitol in Georgia that we, uh, we, they were having a risk committee, uh, a study committee, the Georgia legislature. And to be able to go in there and talk directly to your local legislator is so mm -hmm. different than trying to schedule a meeting with somebody in, in Washington, D.C. And so well, I think and, and we're in Washington, too. Incidentally, we have, since the original ban was rescinded, 15 states uh, have attempted in one form or another to ban Kratom. And we have been successful in all 15 in reversing that and stopping that. Now, there are six during that period that were banned, and we're working in some of those to try to reverse the existing one by getting them to pass the right thing. Mm -hmm. Protect the consumer from the bad actor who's doing the adulteration. Keep it out of the hands of kids and make sure it's properly labeled. That's not a giant reach. That's what everybody should do to protect their business. Definitely. Now, what do you think? We talked a little bit about the study down in um, Dr. McCurdy, his study. Do you think that's going to lead to to um, the eventual scheduling of Kratom, like to a Schedule 2? 
or even a schedule three, or do you think it's going to support um, your take that it's a supplement and a food? I think that we have a difference of opinion on where this goes. Mm -hmm. I have the utmost respect for Christopher McCurdy and his abilities. Um, we are absolutely committed to this being a dietary ingredient mm -hmm. and a food product. Okay. Uh, Dr. McCurdy long term sees the use of this potentially, I think, for the opioid withdrawal right. specifically. Uh, that's one corner of the Kratom universe. And, and frankly, it's a small corner. Mm -hmm. uh, it's used for pain. And it's used for a lot of things. One of those happens to be that anecdotally, we're told. Right. Uh, he's following that path. And I'm sure that what he does is not intended to create a Schedule One situation. I think it's created, uh, intended to create a patentable product mm -hmm. that helps people. Right. So more power to it. Mm -hmm. um, but his his road is that, and our road is this. And there's a number of places where we overlap and can help each other. And whenever that happens, we do so because there's common good feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is definitely a different path. Okay, well, that's great. That's that's it. I. I I thought that's kind of where that was going, but I wasn't sure exactly what they were working on down there. Now, we talked about um, that it's good for opioid withdrawal, and I think anecdotally, and we're not making medical claims here, but my experience is is that when I was cut off from pain medicine from a doctor who'd been prescribing it for three years, uh, long-term chronic pain medicine, um, he stopped, and it was basically go find a pain management doctor. But I called over 10 people, and, and out of those 10, only two would see me, and then it was like four to $600 for the first visit, and then it's a monthly nut on top of that. And so the pain management industry is extremely um, draconian. It's, it's almost like you've been convicted of a crime, and just because you want your pain relieved. And so I'm, I'm glad I found Kratom because it did help with opioid withdrawal symptoms. I'm not addicted or abusive or anything, but anybody who's on long-term opioids, they do develop uh, physical symptoms when they stop. And so I think that's where a lot of the politicians and the regulatory authority are going after people who they think are, um, you know, drug addicts, quote unquote. And that's why I think a lot of people um, are unsure about the safety of Kratom. Because for me, I use it for pain and I've used it for opioid withdrawal symptoms. But I also see that there's a huge push in the industry now for the fitness and health side of it. There's a lot of people getting involved who are who go to the gym every day and use it for energy and what do you, do you personally use it? Have you found any benefits yourself? Yeah, I, I use it. Yeah, I do. By the way, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you see, have you had the surgery? Yeah, I did. When I was actually 11 or 12, I had my colon totally removed. And so okay. I was, I've ended up with a permanent ileostomy and I've had that since I was 16. There's a, a procedure out of uh, Tampa where they're now doing a, a uh, uh, it, it's a non-artificial J pouch is opening. Oh, okay, gotcha. Good friend of mine, and if you want to get to me after this, I'll, I'll introduce you to him. He had that done, and he'd gone through hell until this happened. Now he's been really good for about two years. Oh, that's fantastic. So, uh, he can he can reference you, uh, and I'll be glad to give you his his name and number. Um, Thank you. I use it. Because I'm just older than dirt. <laughs> just that simple. Um, if I play golf, I have some joint issues, mm -hmm. but they go away. And this makes them go away. Um, sometimes I use it prophylactically for that very reason. More, more quasi-arthritic, not really arthritic. Um, and I have no problem using it. I had some this morning, so apparently I must be high, according to the experts as we speak. Um is a broad spectrum. And what we found, there's uh, Oliver Grunman, Dr. Grunman, University of Florida again. He lives in Arizona. Um, he did a study. And in his study, what we found was that the average Kratom user, and I forget the exact numbers, but close enough for hand grenades, uh, is in excess of 35 years old, talks to his primary care physician about the use of Kratom, uh, makes over $30,000 a year, and I think of we are Kratom, we are Kratom is you and it's me and it's middle America and it's soccer moms. And so there's an awful lot of people using this up to 5 million is our estimate, probably higher than that now um, for their general health and well-being. 
get out of our way. Why are you trying to prevent this? What what in the world got in you? And 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 what I hear a fair amount is that as the opioid crisis, I hate the word epidemic on that one. I think yeah. it is a crisis. I've actually done but, a couple episodes with Dr. Thomas Klein, and he he talks about the other side, the actual science behind opioid addiction and how rare it truly is and about how the the use of the word epidemic is used to scare the public and also exactly. to, to so, kick loose billions of dollars of taxpayer money. So when, when we get into the opioid crisis, I think that Kratom was looked at as low-hanging fruit. I agree. We can show you we're doing something, America, for the prevention of this opioid crisis that we're also concerned about. Look, we're going to ban Kratom. I didn't do squat. You want to stop the pill mills and you are a victim now, uh, pain management, where at the drop of a hat, they'll hit you with a thousand dollars worth of blood tests. Yep. Uncontrolled, unfettered, nothing you can do about it. And it's your only pathway if you don't have something else to ease your pain. Exactly. Uh, when, when they, when they do all this stuff to you, the, the, that's a good way of putting all of this stuff. You could stop this tomorrow if pill mills are the real issue. And the way you stop it is you put together two teams, eight men per team, one in Kansas City, one in Washington, D.C., and you send them out and you have them do a thousand inspections of people that prescribe Kratom or excuse me, opioids. And the way you do that is you get a street sign picture of the nearest cross section of that person's office. And then you take a picture of that office and then you ask the operative questions. And when you find storefronts that have nothing to them and you've got the cross street pictures proving you're in the correct location, you can stop this stuff pretty well. The reason I know this is I had two crews, one in Kansas City and one in Washington, eight people each. This was during the Resolution Trust Corporation salvaging of the American Savings and Loan Crisis. Mm. Our crews inspected over a thousand properties with a book value in excess of three and a half billion dollars in two and a half years. Wow. That's all you have to do. Now, if it's a pill mill, I think you'll see an empty storefront. There won't be patients. Mm -hmm. Will someone get caught in that crossfire? Probably. But it's a whole lot better than trying to come after you as a pain patient. Right. I totally agree. And the DEA, you know, they've raised their budget 40 percent this year alone. And they're going and they've cut production of opioids by a third, I believe it is. And so there's a, there's millions of actually pain patients out there who have been left in the dark. And there's terrible Absolutely. stories of suicide of because going through like opioid withdrawal, Plus, still dealing with your chronic pain, I wouldn't wish that on even uh, FDA regulators. I wouldn't even wish that on them. It's a, it's a terrible thing to to experience. So I'm very grateful for Kratom, very grateful for what what you guys are doing. What how, how do you see going forward? Do you are you positive about the direction we are? Because I don't think people truly understand how big a deal it was for the DEA to reverse what they what the FDA was telling them to do, and about how unique that is in the history of kind of drug prohibition in modern America? Oh, I don't know if it's unique. A, a DEA has, has tried to schedule one ban 82 times, and they've succeeded 81. <laughs> right. We are the only time that they have failed. So I'm being facetious. Of course, it's a big deal. Right. Uh, but it was a hue and cry from the land. Again, I don't know that we're right. I can't guarantee you anything right. from our perspective and direction and for planning. Uh, we think that the science and the facts are the key here. And we think that legislation protecting the consumer is a viable pathway to ensure that we have a mature industry that self-regulates and that is worthy of being around and that we can maybe hopefully talk to FDA about jointly helping on regulation of some of extracts. We don't think they should touch the leaf or the powder, by the way, that okay. should be sacrosanct. Excellent. And it's, it's, I read a quote somewhere. It said, it talked about uh, ca cannabis, but it was talking about God's pharmacy about that. You know, it's really a miracle that we have plants like cannabis, uh, the poppy flower, and uh, Kratom out there that we have the receptors in, 
in our brains that they can actually affect our well-being in positive ways. And I think drugs are, are demonized a lot of times, almost in a religious aspect that people go after them, especially when they want to regulate them. How many drugs have killed people that are FDA approved? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Mostly. Right. So I'm having a hard time with that entire conversation. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that anything that grows out of the ground is safe. Exactly. That's not true. That's perfect. But I'm not going to tell you that anything that's synthesized and manufactured and FDA approved is safe either, because that's not true. Right. If we have this crisis that we argued about whether it's an epidemic or not, is it an epidemic of natural products coming from the earth, or is it an epidemic of products that were approved by the FDA? Yeah, it's, it's a fentanyl issue, actually. You know, it's an adulterated heroin and a fentanyl issue. That's really what's killing people. Well, and, and FDA kind of led the way. They did, but. exactly. You're, that, you're, and, and prohibition leads to this. The iron law of prohibition is that when you start um, cracking down on stuff like cannabis and then different things, people, the people who supply it are always going to go for the higher strength, smallest dose that they can smuggle in because it's much easier to smuggle in fentanyl than it is, you know, um, a crate full of pills. And so I think that's well, what we're seeing a lot of that. We know that Kratom doesn't kill you. Mm -hmm. We know that. The animal studies prove it. There's a lot of things that prove it. it, uh, it Kratom doesn't kill you. Mm -hmm. We also know if you ban Kratom, people are going to die. Right. And that's not talked about that much. If you create a banned product, you'll create a black market. Black market in prohibition has never worked out well. No. It becomes truly adulterated product. It becomes anything and everything from the wild, wild west. It becomes guys with guns making money. Mm -hmm. uh, people are going to die. I'm not quite sure which one of those will kill them, but we have multiple choices. And so we look at that and we go uh, one step further. Let's say, for argument's sake, that you accept our premise that Kratom is non-harmful to you. If it only helps one person get off of opioid withdrawal, just one, but it doesn't harm you, why would you want to prevent that? I'm not going to get in a conversation about how many people are doing this or how many people are doing that. Exactly. I believe the issue is, is it safe? And if it's safe and it helps one person, damn, we ought to be glad to do that. We should be celebrating it as a miracle plant. I really do. I, that's that's my take. Yeah, I, I, I've offered to nominate it as for the Nobel Prize. And I used to think that um, if if cannabis was uh, discovered in the Amazon, like today, people would herald it as a miracle plant. But I think I was wrong about that because we found kratom relatively recently for a myriad of things, and it seems like people are um, are demonizing just as much as they did with, with cannabis. Well, and, and I think there's more to the safety profile issues. There's a lot of things you could schedule in this world. Mm -hmm. Jack Henningfield talks about that quite a bit. Um, but their safety profiles are such that the good outweighs any potential you would, would attain by scheduling it. Right. I mean, I, I know darn well if you discovered sugar today, it'd be banned. <laughs> they tried to ban cereal, the FDA, in, in the 70s. They tried to ban so, children's cereal. You know, uh, caffeine can kill you uh, in a concentrated enough dose, but we don't ban caffeine. Right. We have laws against uh, uh, the, the concentration levels. And that's kind of where, let's go back to our, our premise that if we have the right legislation protecting the the percentages and relationships within the within the plant of the alkaloids, then you as a consumer are safe. And that's all we're trying to do. Now, as far as the AKA's mission going forward, what do you, you guys are focused on the state legislatures and um, what can you do about the, uh, the import ban? What, what legally can people do to, what can the average person like myself do? Should we contact our representatives? Should we send emails to the FDA? What, what would you suggest? I think you have the freedom as an American to take any of the paths you choose. We hope that whatever path it is, it's respectful. That's a good point. Um, our future path, again, I shared with you earlier, we can only do what we think is right. Mm -hmm. Does that guarantee that we're right? Well, of course not. Right. 
as far as the import ban goes, we have to get them to step to the table, they being the FDA, to come to the table and understand what's going on. When the ban failed in the end of 2016, uh, everybody went, wow, look at us, we won. Right. We were saying, you know, this is an evolutionary animal that prints money and prints lawyers. Right. I, I don't think it's quite time to cheer yet, folks. And so now we've seen a movement, the shadow ban, where they're going state after state, they're going area after area, they're trying to come in from the bottom and come up and, and create a, a, the shadow ban that bans the product. We don't know where they're going to go next. Okay. Uh, oftentimes we think that, that their mission is to run us into the ground financially. Mm -hmm. If you look around the arena, you'll see less and less groups uh, in the advocacy area. Um, we've managed to to stay in the game, and it's because of people like y'all that give us the funding we need to keep fighting. We know that if tomorrow FDA decided to ban Cradle or schedule Cradle, that we would be in for a two- to four-year fight. Right. We would not go quietly. We would not go easily. But just the legal fees in that fight would be in excess of a million dollars. Wow. That's the number. Wow. We've priced it. We've gone to the law firms. That's your that's your ticket. Could be higher, but it won't be lower. Mm -hmm. and so looking at that, it, you know, FDA, if their mindset is win no matter what, mm -hmm. then what they're doing going state by state by state. We had last year 15 different states with paid lobbyists on the ground. Is that government paid lobbyists or, or no, that's our lobbyists. no, your lobbyist? Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And uh, and we and we just uh, signed a new contract for a new state uh, this past week because we hear rumblings of what's about to be proposed there, and we're not going to go quietly. Um, so oftentimes it seems that their plan is nothing more than to outspend us, right. you know, kind of like Reagan did to the Soviet Union. <laughs> right. That's what he did. Mm -hmm. Spent him in the ground. Um, we haven't gone yet. Our supporters are really strong-willed. Uh, they, they, they're on our side, and we try to show them that we're on their side. Mm -hmm. And so the contributions that we've received uh, keep us going, and more importantly, keep the FDA from running over us. We don't know where they're going to go next, mm -hmm. but we haven't been convinced yet that they're going to go anywhere quietly. Uh, because if they were, I think they would agree to sit down with us and let's negotiate what makes sense. But that doesn't seem to be how things work these days. It doesn't. And I would urge everybody who's a libertarian, who believes in individual freedom, who believes that you own your own body and mind to donate to you guys, because I, I haven't seen uh, any organization. And I've been in kind of the liberty movement for 10 years now, and I've never seen one that's actually doing something to create more freedom for, for millions and millions of people like you guys are doing. Well, thank you. Yeah. So if you use Kratom or not, check out... AmericanKratom.org and consider donating because these guys are really doing the work. Um, the meeting that I went to at the Georgia Capitol was very impressive. How you guys operated, how you how you stressed about being respectful. And can you just touch on that for just a moment before we finish? I know we're wrapping up here, but about okay. how how to approach the people in government because we feel like they should be our public servants, but I don't think they view it that way. And how we speak to other people, I think, is very important when we're trying to get our ideas across. What's happened often, and not just in creative world, is that people look at their adversary through their worst light and look at themselves through their best light. And I would argue you should reverse that. That's a great point. Uh, I think that you need to be able to, at some point in time, reach out your hand and say, we can do this together. We have a difference of opinion. I'm not sure we have a difference of intent. Gotcha. And so we're convinced ours is correct. And by the way, they may be convinced theirs is correct. Mm -hmm. um, so calling them names doesn't move the needle at all. Um, sooner or later, we believe the facts will win out. That's why we stress them so hard. That's why we spend so much money on science, mm -hmm. uh, because that's the ultimate answer. And I will tell you as a group, we will go where the science goes, good, bad, or ugly. Right. Uh, we would, that uh, Commissioner Gottlieb would do the same thing. Excellent. Excellent. I, and I just wanted to um, 
uh, to, to tell everybody that if you have, if you're involved in the Kratom world, if, if uh, you believe in individual freedom, check out what your local states are doing because you can affect change by going there and telling your story and talking to the legislators, uh, legis legislators face to face. Cause I think that, uh, we had about, what was it about 50 people at that meeting? It seemed like, I'm what? not sure. And it was, it was 95% four and about five percent that was um they had their own agendas i believe um but you can make a difference and, and our legislators do talk to us especially at the local level yeah thank you for coming yeah definitely well thanks dave for for being here stick around for a second but i just want to okay. urge everybody to go to americankratom.org consider donating read the science for yourself we're not advocating that everybody go try kratom you know but um but if you're interested in kratom that's the number one place I send people is to your website because all the science is there, all the testimonials are there, and I think it's a, uh, an amazing resource that you're providing for folks. Thank you. Is there anywhere else that, it, that uh, you would direct people to, Dave, where they can um, follow what you guys are doing? Well, we, we put out a number of uh, emails. Mm -hmm. If you'll join the forum okay. on the website, um, th that will put you on our mailing list. And as information becomes available, we will share that. Excellent. And that's how I found out about the meeting here in Georgia. So I want to thank you for that. And I actually went around and talked to the local shops, you know, the head shops in different places that sell it, the health food stores. And, um, you know, I think that's, I think that's what we need to do if we want to, because if we lose freedom, it's almost our fault. That's how I, I view it now that we're not doing enough to, um, to tell our story because I think the story of individual liberty, of inherent rights, um, that's, that's a story, once people understand it, that uh, it makes a lot of sense to them. One final thought for you. Mm -hmm. Because of the import alert and reputational risk, you don't find Kratom and GNC, except in some rare instances, or Walmart or any of the major stores. Right. Uh, that's not because Kratom is bad. It's because FDA's disinformation campaign has created a reputational risk environment through the import alerts. So we see a future where we will be in those stores. That's fantastic. I can't wait for that. Well, thank you, Dave, for your time today, my man. I appreciate all that your work that you're doing. And like I said, if anybody wants to change the world, if anybody wants to create a world with more freedom, follow what American Kratom Association is doing. You know, find that one issue that you're passionate about and model how they actually are engaging with the legislators and with the public to, um, to increase freedom for us all. So thanks, Dave. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.